day two of the 2023 NASDAQ Investor Conference. We hope it's been a productive couple days. We're, uh, we're very thrilled to have David Golden with us, with us, the CFO of Booking Holdings. Uh, before we get started, David, let me read the uh, all important disclosures. Thank you. Please do that. Please note that all important disclosures, including personal holdings disclosures and Morgan Stanley disclosures, appear on the Morgan Stanley Public website at www.morganstanley.com forward slash research disclosures. Some of the statements made today by Booking Holdings may be considered forward looking. These statements include a number of risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially. Any forward looking statements made today by the company are based on assumptions as of today, and Booking undertakes no obligation to update them. Please refer to Booking Holdings Form 10K or Form 10Q for a discussion of the risk factors that may impact actual results. <coughs> How you doing? Good, you? Good, good. Great to be here. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us again. You're very welcome. Our annual catch up on what is going on in the, the state of travel and uh, the year ahead in travel. So maybe let's sort of start with, with that. So the, the state of the overall travel market and sort of, you know, you made some comments at earnings about sort of the, the demand resiliency and demand trends around the consumer. What, what are sort of the latest commentary you're making about sort of the state of travel demand you're seeing through booking? Yeah, so what we're seeing is a very healthy consumer profile right now. We look at a couple of things to understand what's happening. Obviously, the growth rate, that's kind of obvious, and the growth rates are strong. But then we look into the future, and we see what are the early, the early indicators. Um, and typically what happens is if things do slow down, which is kind of what's on the back of people's mind, uh, it manifests itself in two ways. Mm -hmm. uh, people will either uh, trade down uh, from a higher star to a lower star property, or they'll shorten their, their, their length of stay. Um, we're not seeing that in any of our markets. Um, and moreover, we're actually seeing the length of stay increase. So people, sorry, the, the, the booking window increase. So people are actually wanting to book more further ahead than they were before, which usually would be a sign of confidence. Mm -hmm. So uh, we see the uh, consumer demand uh, strong. We see, obviously, you look at the data, uh, we see a movement towards uh, services rather than goods. And also bear in mind that if the, the average traveler, if there is such a thing on, on a platform and they're spending a few thousand euros or dollars a year on the family vacation, maybe once or twice or three times or more, you know, they're in the upper category from, a, earning, from an income point of view, so the balance sheets are a little stronger than the average as well. So I think that bodes uh, positively. But uh, we see a, a strong outlook. And because of the longer uh, booking window, we actually have more visibility and more on the books in 2024 than when we've had either this time looking into 23 or in 2019 looking into 2020. Got it. Okay. I want to sort of get into the, the regions a little bit and ask about the U.S., but maybe before I do the, the U.S. discussion, could we just talk ADRs a little bit? Um, you know, ADRs over the, the course of this year, and it's, it is macro demand linked, have held in better than we thought certainly, um, and, and, and a lot of different channels. So maybe just sort of talk to us about what you're seeing from an ADR perspective, and how do you think about sort of reasonable ranges of outcomes for ADRs looking into 2024? Yeah, so obviously ADRs have acted a little um, differently in this recovery than they have in prior recoveries. Typically, it's a lagging indicator. Demand comes back first, then ADRs catch up. This time around, ADRs accelerated faster than demand did, right? So ADRs have been elevated for a couple of years, uh, now and obviously we're only getting back to probably the t total levels of travel from a volume point of view that we were in 2019. Um, so that's a little unusual. Um, a lot of that was driven by inflationary pressure, we believe. Talking to the uh, hoteliers and property um, owners, they were very much at the epicenter of multiple factors around inflation, whether it be labor costs or utilities, food, beverage, all those things were, you know, yes. were, were high uh, cost drivers. Uh, what we're seeing right now is we're seeing a reduction in the rate of increase. Right, second, so it's a bit like inflation is coming down, but they're still going up. But the reduction in the rate of increase is there. We believe that for this quarter, the fourth quarter, we guide to a, probably about a 2% year on year increase in ADRs. It's lower than it has been and more in line with inflation. Uh, we have a couple of points of uh, uh, geo mix against us on there because Asia is still recovering faster. So maybe four percentage points increase on a light like region basis, but that's a more moderate rate. So I think going forward, um, that seems to be uh, the way of thinking about ADRs into next year, assuming that there's not a big downturn. I think ADRs will be steady to you know, increasing a little bit, probably more in line with inflation 
um, and not doing what they've been doing for the last couple of years in terms of the rate of increase. Got it. And is there any difference in the ADR trends in your traditional hotel business versus your alternative accommodation properties? Um, nothing appreciable. No, I mean, uh, they both up, you know, they're both up 30% versus 2019. It seems like a, a big number, and it is. But bear in mind, we're talking four years worth of compounding impact, right? So on that basis, it doesn't look quite so crazy. Um, but no, I've seen nothing to call out in terms of differences. Okay. Well, let's talk about the U.S. a little bit. Um, you've made some very good progress in the, the U.S. Uh, in taking more share of the overall leisure travel business, leisure travel demand post-COVID. Um, but it seems like you know, the business has decelerated a bit based on you know, your 3Q commentary and sort of you know, extrapolation into 4Q, et cetera. I guess the question is, as we look into 24, what strategic initiatives do you have in place to sort of reaccelerate the U.S. growth to sort of start taking share once again? Yeah, I think you have to separate the market from, from, from us in both these cases. I think that uh, the U.S. growth rate, the market growth rate, has struggled a little bit this year compared to other regions because if you remember, uh, U.S. had a significant uh, rebounding growth in 2022 right. and was way ahead of the rest of the world. So I think year on year there's been some um, digestion comparisons in the US. I think other markets in the world have recovered on a more linear basis, so maybe we'll be less of a factor there. Uh, when we look at uh, how we're doing in our core segment in the US, which is really the business to consumer ledger segment, mm -hmm. right? So take out business to, to business, take out uh, business travel, take out group travel, etc. I think we've been doing well they're um, growing faster than the market, although they're not gaining quite as much share as we gained in the last couple of years, but still gaining share. Mm -hmm. um, so the path forward is not that much different than the path we've been taking. It's the kind of same playbook we've worked in in other markets about having a better product, enabling people to find the right property at the right price, um, having great customer service. Um, that's the playbook. And then, of course, adding to that with the other elements of the business, providing payments, providing flights, um, providing ground transportation, um, doing great marketing, increasing our brand awareness, building out the alternative profile, which is obviously somewhere something we have a bit more lifting to do in the US than, than, than elsewhere, and ultimately pulling that all together in the connected trip. I mean, that, that is what our uh, playbook is, um, and that's how we'll continue to gain in the US. Okay. Um, no, there's, there's some other data as well that sort of speaks to how some of the cross-border demand trends have stayed stronger than even domestic US trends, so that's part of it probably too impacting guys. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, people in the U.S. who've been more exposed to domestic travel really had a tough year this year because in the U.S., the big rebound we saw in growth last year was a lot of domestic travel, and then a lot of that has moved to, to international. Now, of course, we, you know, we see both sides of that. Yep. But if you've been a travel player in more folk, you look at, look at the, some, some of those smaller regional airlines that have been more exposed to domestic travel. Uh, they've had a much harder time, for example, in the international airlines, and the same would apply to the OTAs as well. Yep, yep that makes sense. Um, Okay, so let's talk about sort of the guide, gu guideposts and targets you've sort of laid out for the post-COVID growth algorithm. I know in the past we sort of talked about, you know, how you think about growth 2019 versus post-COVID, like how fast you're going to grow versus 2019. Walk us through again sort of your latest way to think about, you know, KPI, bookings, revenue, EPS growth, however you think about it going forward versus pre-COVID, and what are the initiatives to kind of drive those numbers? Yeah, great, Brian. So that's very helpful. So the KPIs, if you look at where we were pre-COVID, let's call it 2019, right, mm -hmm. the last clean full year before COVID, and look at what the growth rates were in the business, I point you to kind of three key numbers. And this is in currency to make it comparable with what you might look at going forward. Uh, bookings and revenue were both going at 8%. Earnings per share were growing at 15. Um, and our model going forward is based upon all the things we've done to invest and build upon the capabilities in the business, which I'll come back to in just a second. Mm -hmm. Our model is, or the algo is, that when we get to normal market growth rates again, whatever they are, let's call it 24, 25, let's call it 24, that's where the market uh, growth rate would turn back to a more normal rate. We believe we can grow faster than we did in those, against each of those metrics. Uh, than we did in 2019, even though the business is and will be that, that much bigger. You know? So um, you, you may say, well, that's, that is a define the law of physics a, 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 a little bit, but it's not because we've built uh, a lot of capabilities that didn't exist in the business. So if you go back to the business in 2019, um, and obviously most of our business is, is, is booking.com or was booking.com, so I'll focus there. We had to kind of two major, um, if you like, 
pillars to the stool that supported that growth. We had a great accommodations business, very broad, um, and with a scale, out, scale out advantage over anybody else globally, and we had great performance marketing. Those really were the two foundations that that business was, was grown upon. And we've, we've kept those, and we've enhanced them, but we've added a whole lot to it. So in the accommodation space, now we have a much bigger alternative offering to complement our core hotel offering. Alternatives are a third of our total business. Performance marketing is still a strong asset. We've built out a payments platform, which now accounts for over half of our uh, TCV bookings. Um, on the back of that payments platform, we've built a second marketing muscle called merchandising. Mm -hmm. We weren't participating in the pricing equation at all in 2019. Now we can selectively and targetedly. Uh, so that's the second marketing engine we didn't have uh, before. We've, done, we've become much more proactive and strategic in brand. So we really now have three demand generation channels compared to only one. Um, back in 2019 in Booking.com, we only sold accommodations. Mm -hmm. Now we have Booking.com flights, uh, attractions, ground transportation, taxi, insurance. None of those existed prior to that. Um, the app was about a just over a quarter of our bookings in 2019. Now it's over half. Um, and we have a genius, and we have a, a loyalty program which is now branded and very strong and uh, well recognized with three different tiers the genius program. That was an internal only program only. So I would hesit I, I'd say, uh, shame on us if we can't grow right. that new profile <clears throat> faster than we grew the old profile, which is kind of exactly why we believe we can support that commitment. Okay, it's pretty. Uh, it's a pretty good layer cake. A lot, a lot, a lot of layers to that. That, um, that makes sense. Um, over the course of the last twelve months, you and I have had a lot of discussions about AI. Um, you know, when we were Every sitting time. here, it was yeah, a, lo a lot, a lot of generative AI discussions. Um, it was about a year ago. We were hanging out, and you know, everyone was trying to figure out what is this ChatGPT thing. Uh, twelve months have now passed. So, we're twelve months. Twelve months since last year, when all that discussion really started. Let's sort of start with the opportunities and how you think about. What are the biggest opportunities for Booking.com and the OTAs in general from using these large language models and generative AI capabilities over the long term? Yeah, I put it into uh, three buckets. So the first would be our vision. Um, so we, for a long time, back in 2019, have been talking about this concept of a connected trip where we want to um, use technology to enable customers to uh, plan book and experience travel in a fundamentally different way. Mm -hmm. That has always depended upon um, the availability of more sophisticated AI technologies than existed then. Uh, we've built our business on AI for decades plus, right? <coughs> Almost all the things that our platforms do are powered by, by AI, whether it's how we bid on, on paid channels, how we um, present uh, offerings to, to customers, there's AI engines behind that. So for us, this is great because this now enables us to go forward in our vision. Mm -hmm. um, and so what are we doing? We're doing a couple of things. So uh, we're already using some of these um, LLMs powered tools to uh, create travel assistance inside of our own uh, pro, uh, inside of our own offering. So we talked about booking.com, how important the app is now. Yep. Um, uh, now, if you're in the US or you're in the, in, 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 in the UK, so far it's only in those two markets, but we now have uh, an AI powered gen, AI powered travel assistance in the booking.com app that will let you start planning about your trip. And it's very smart because uh, it has an abstraction layer so we can plug in multiple large language modules in the future. But not only does it rely upon the public data, it also, through our machine learning gateways, gets to our data, so it brings up our data, which includes things like availability on properties that aren't available on the public sector. So it lets you basically use the best of both worlds to plan and then book your trip. You don't need to leave the chat, the chat assistant to actually book. Um, so far, it only works on accommodation, but we'll make it work across the entire set of our offerings. Um, so we're, we're using it. Uh, we're getting great feedback. It actually, it, it works. We were in Frankfurt this uh, this week, and I pulled it out and showed it to some, some investors, and everybody was kind of impressed, and so was I, because I hadn't used it for a couple of weeks, and, and it got better yep. than it did last time. Um, we have other parts of the business where we're experimenting, again, in the customer booking path, in uh, Priceline, uh, one of our US brands, we have and again, a travel assistant. We put that at the bottom of the, of the booking funnel, right where people want, might want to book, book a hotel. And uh, it's there to ask questions to it just before you make your booking. Um, and it will, um, we again, getting great experience. Uh, people will go in and ask maybe about locations, what's nearby, 
cancellation policies that go back into our data to find that out. Pet policies may go back to the hotel site, et cetera. These are things that people look at. And interestingly enough, in terms of the productivity side, we now have good data that says that people who actually use that tool before they book are less likely to make a customer service call afterwards. So, aha, I just saved some money. I just converted a more expensive customer service call uh, into a, you know, a large language module uh, query. So those are things that we're doing um, internally. We really believe that we can enhance our products, and particularly at Booking.com, where the connected trip is the kind of centerpiece of the vision. You know, this is what we need to get there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we need to be able to massively personalize um, the booking experience, uh, the, 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 the planning experience, the booking experience, and we need to be able to be able to reactively and proactively provide customer support to people based upon what happens uh, to their booking. And we also need to be able to act with them, react with them in trip, you know, based upon what's happening. Maybe you've gone to a beach vacation and it's raining, so what do we do? We kind of recommend places that you might want to go. And by the way, here's an offer to go book it and here's access to the pass on booking.com. All these things are possible mm -hmm. with this class of technology. So it really plays into our strategy. Um, and then internally, I shouldn't miss up the internal side of this, uh, there are productivity gains in multiple parts of, of the business. I think you know, many parts of most businesses will be touched in some way, shape, or form by these technologies. We have are focused on two areas right now where we're running a, a bunch of programs and projects. One, I mentioned customer service. I talked about how we can avoid customer service calls uh, by using these tools up front. But obviously, the customer service experience, we already have chatbots, but to make them much more uh, intelligent um, and to be able to you know, b replace more of the human interaction with the machine interaction, that's, that's real, we're doing some work there. And then the other big area I'd say for tech companies like ours is developer productivity. Right. Um, using these um, uh, tools to help developers become more productive, convert your lower experienced uh, mm -hmm. engineers into higher experienced en en engineers, there's real leverage there. And uh, we're getting some good results from the work we're doing there as well. Okay, that's, a, that's great, there's a, there's a lot there. Um, let me let me throw the AI question at you a different way. Um, okay. You know, there's a there's a point in the consumer funnel where you know a lot of people still start on Google to do their travel research. Even though again, you still have a very very successful performance business to buy traffic off of Google to bring to your site. You know, we think there's a possibility that at some point Google could have a next gen travel assistant to roll out where they could help plan my my trip for the weekend in Europe. How do you sort of think about that risk of a higher percentage of people using a Google tool first instead of a booking tool to be my travel assistant. Does that impact the paid mix? Like, how do you sort of think about that long term? I think there's a few as aspects of that. I mean, Google will, I'm sure, want to continue to monetize their search business. Yep. Um, so they'll want to make sure it's attractive for people like us to want to, av to advertise on their platform. You know, we spend billions a year, billions of dollars a year. We're one of their biggest uh, customers. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure as their search experience. Um, evolves uh, and we'll evolve with them as we have done over many, uh, many uh, years. Of course, we'll be building our own uh, right. direct channel. I talked about what we're doing on Booking.com. Yep. You know, we, we now, by definition, if we're over well over half of our um, mix is direct. You know, more than half of our bookings are starting on 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 our platforms rather than somebody else's platform, which we're paying to bring into our platform. Mm -hmm. um, to the extent that I'm sure there'll be people, will, I'm sure there'll be. Um, AI powered travel assistance and they'll do some of the planning function, right? Uh, we'll have a great planning tool as well, but that's probably where they'll stop because what these travel assistants won't have is the full depth of capability that we as an online travel agent have. We have uh, you know, active relationships with over 3 million properties around the world in the accommodation space where we have real time availability. That's not available publicly. Mm -hmm. um, we have similar with airlines and all the other players. Uh, we have thousands of people doing customer service. We have a payments platform where you can pay for it all in one place and manage, and I can go on and, and on and on. So again, it's kind of how you top the, to your point, what do you do at the top of the funnel mm -hmm. um, and what tools can, can you create? Uh, we believe with our combination of, the, of our travel assistant sitting inside of our data, inside of our system, having access to public data and all the data that we have, we think we can still build a, in totality a differentiated travel offering, and we believe in that world we can continue to increase our direct mix. Got it. Yep. No, you're uh, you know, in this in this new AI world, data is more valuable than ever, and all the the connections, the, the live real time connections that you have with all the hotels is really valuable. It's, so that's going to be a key difference. That's huge. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. Earlier, you mentioned uh, sort of the the marketing muscle, the merchandising muscle, and sort of the way you developed a couple multiple ways to bring people into the funnel, you yep. have to convert. So 
Remind us again how we should think about marketing plus merchandising as a percentage of bookings this year and then sort of strategically into 2024. How do we think about sort of leverage or spend on marketing and merchandising in 24? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll rewind a little bit to what we did during the COVID recovery year. So if you go back to, two, to 2019, again, that benchmark year for the kind of yep. growth hurdles, uh, that year we spent 5.5% uh, of our total gross bookings on marketing and merchandising com 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 combined. And we, um, we actually, and that was, l that was less than we spent in 2018 because the diet mix had, had increased, so, so that was going down. Um, so, but what we decided to do during COVID was something maybe uh, bold, but it's worked out well for us. We chose to kind of lean in and spend more because how many opportunities do you get for the travel industry to grow at 30, 40, 50% a year? You know, one of it did in, in 21 and 22 as it was recovering. So we did that proactively. So you get to, to, to last year, and that, percent, and that spend on marketing and merchandising went up to close to 6% of mm -hmm. gross bookings, which of course, as a percentage of revenue, is a really big increase, right? A pretty bold increase. But there again, back to what we were doing, you know, uh, back to where we are now as a result of that, let's assume that uh, travel demand globally from a room night point of view is back to almost break even. You know, we're 25% above where we were in 2019. So we've really, you know, that's paid, paid off for us. So, yep. um, and this year you can see that we've started against that higher we're still leaning in because we think there's a good opportunity to continue to, to gain share. Uh, but this year, uh, we will spend less on marketing and merchandising than we did um, last year, so starting to, to lever, and still pretty more than we did in, in, in 2019. And that leverage on the marketing and merchandising spend, because marketing and merchandising combined is the biggest spend in our income statement, right. uh, that leverage we do expect to see continuing going forward. Um, mm -hmm. Probably driven more than, than anything else by the direct mix increase. Obviously, uh, that's a key part of our strategy. And to the extent that continues, which we expect it to, then you've just got a smaller piece of the total business where you're having to spend on marketing and merchandising and more of it coming in directly. Got it. Okay. Um, and then and the other pieces of the OPEX, you mentioned sort of the customer service, seeing some benefits from AI, assisted coding, seeing some benefits from AI. You know, are there, is it... Is it, are we far enough along where you could see efficiency in those lines in 24 yet, or is it still too early in sort of customer service and Gen AI benefits to developers to see leverage in 24? Yeah, I don't think that Gen AI, Gen AI is gonna drive a quantum change in things in 24. I think we're gonna get some incremental benefits, we'll be rolling it out more. Yep. I mean, the, particularly in something like customer service, you have to go build the technology in, and you have to have a, a modern uh, customer service platform, which we now have. Um, but that's going to take some time. We'll probably be um, introducing some more, some smarter bots and things, but I don't think it'll make a, a, a big difference. I think the developer productivity one may come a little quicker mm -hmm. um, as we roll that out across a bigger piece of our development uh, uh, team. But in generally, I think our story on the more direct fixed cost, which is kind of where, where you're talking, Brian, is that uh, we have been investing, right? When I talk about what, what we did in 2019, what we do in 2024, and all the differences, you don't get that for free. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's, there's a lot of technology, there's a, there's a lot of investment, there's a lot of new people you need to build out these capabilities. And we have been uh, delevering on that more fixed cost base for a couple of years, again, kind of by design. And if you think about it, a fairly bold strategy because we were spending more on marketing merchandising and more on, on fixed costs, but obviously you can see the benefit in both sides, right? You see the growth mm -hmm. on one side and you see the capabilities that we've built on the other side. So I think our, so our commitment is that next year we'll grow that uh, fixed cost uh, combination of GNA, IT and personnel appreciably slower than we are doing this year. And we do expect to get back to leverage over time on that fixed cost base. Got it, okay. Um, that's helpful. One of the other pieces of the layer cake you mentioned earlier was, was genius and loyalty. Um, and I feel like over the years in online travel, you know, we have this debate of is, is loyalty high ROI, low ROI? You know, where, where are we now in loyalty? It sort of is, you know, swung back and forth over the last 15 years. So question on genius. One, what is sort of the, the latest update you have on genius adoption, genius, penet genius penetration that you'll share? What can you tell us about purchase behavior of geniuses versus non-geniuses. And then um, on the go forward, what are the keys to driving further genius adoption on the platform? Yeah, so as I mentioned in my comments before you know, in 19 versus now, we had this thing called genius. It was internal. Yep. Um, and it's a, 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 a little story because the marketing theorists said, well, 
I want to make sure that I always have a holdout group of unlucky geniuses who don't get genius to see exactly the benefit of one versus the other. And that's a helpful thing from a marketing point of view, but um, doesn't, doesn't outweigh the benefit of actually bringing the program out into the wild and making a thing of it, mm -hmm. um, which is what we did um, in 2020 and, uh, and, and, and beyond. So now the Genius, um, so when we made G Genius public, it, it, its first versions, uh, there was basically two tiers, a Genius 1 and Genius 2. And to get to Genius 1, you had to have booked, book, booked and stayed twice in two years. And the Genius 2 booked and stayed five times. And that was the, and then, then that was obviously our, the higher end of, of our customer base. Now, Genius has expanded further. We, in 2021, introduced a new kind of redefined tier, tier, tier one to anybody who has a logged on account. So you don't have to have made your first booking, you get a Genius benefit. And uh, then raise the bar on the other two tiers. So now to become a Genius level two, you have to have booked and stayed five times in two years. And Genius level three, booked and stayed 15 times mm -hmm. in two years. And we have millions of people who are Genius level three, right? So it's not just, a, it's given the size of our customer base, that's a big group still. Yeah. Um, so, there, and that, that now enables us to create tiered benefits, right? So the base genius level one benefits are very attractive, but obviously they get better and better when you go up to, 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 to two and three. Now, where, where, where are we taking it? Um, not surprisingly, we're taking it in the direction of the connected trip. So genius historically has been an accommodation centric program. That's where most of the uh, benefits uh, lay right now. By the way, the genius with genius is that almost all those benefits are provided by the hoteliers or by the property providers, because we can show them that they're going to get incremental demand if they market themselves attractively to our, to our top customers. So that's really good. And also, you know, it makes, makes our, if you like, genius closed user group you know, more attractive than people who are not in that program. But where we're going to take it is now you start to see us offering genius benefit for rental cars inside of booking.com. And our plan would be, um, you know, sometimes toward the end of next year, that all the verticals that we have will have genius benefits. And then we'll take more of our merchandising and apply that to genius customers. So um, entice our uh, more loyal customers towards the connected trip, give them incentives for doing more than one thing with us. Uh, for example, if you're a genius level three customer and you're making a high value accommodation booking, we may say, okay, we'll pay for your pickup ride from the airport, train station, et cetera, mm -hmm. and use, and that's another form of merchandising. So it's, it's actually an important program that will uh, become more prominent as we get further down the route towards the connected trip. The genius of genius. Exactly, the genius of genius. That, that sounds like an ad campaign, <laughs> if you, you just basically wrote a tagline. Um, Let's talk about um, alternative accommodations. Um, so you've, uh, another, another area, you've made a lot of progress uh, in alternative accommodations the last few years. So one, just sort of update us, you mentioned is about a third of the business or 30% of the business. Um, how, how fast is that growing at this point? Where have you made the most progress? And as you kind of look into 24, what geos or types of inventory are you sort of most focused on adding to the alternative accommodation business? Yeah, so um, we have made good progress. We're very pleased with it. Uh, it's now one third, not 30%. It's a third of our bookings at booking.com are from the alternative segment. Um, that grew 24% year on year mm -hmm. last year, uh, last quarter, sorry, in, yep. in Q3 compared to 15. In total, you do the math, that meant that the hotel sector was still double digits, low double, double, double digits, so oh, twice the rate. Yep. Um, now, I don't think we're going to have that two to one difference going forward, but uh, we're very pleased with how things are going. I think. Uh, the, we expect the alternative segment to grow a few percentage points faster than the, than the total business uh, going forward. Um, we have been adding inventory. We now have uh, uh, 7.2 million listings in the alternative space. That's up 9% uh, higher than, 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 than last year. We want to continue to build that out. In terms of focus, we talk about the average being a third, mm -hmm. um, the average mix being a third. In Europe, that's a fair amount higher right. than a third. And in the US, we've been very vocal about this, it's a fair amount lower. Um, because a main reason for one is that we've been doing alternative accommodations in Europe for 15, 15 plus years, and we are several years behind that in terms of just time of evolution in the US. So you know, we're probably seven or eight years behind that in terms of when we started building out one versus the other. Now, we don't expect it to take seven or eight years for us to catch up. We'll take advantage of the learnings, but you know, that's a key area. So to answer your question, uh, the US continues to be a big a key focus for acquisition. Uh, the, the listings grew faster in the US than any other marketplace compared to other markets. When I look at that, 8%, 9% 9 growth in year on year listings. And we continue to push to grow the listings in the business in the US the fastest. Got it. So grow a few, a few hundred basis points faster than the, the other piece. The, than, than, than the total. Than the total. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, okay. That's yeah. helpful. 
And by, by my math, I think you're adding more alternative accommodation room nights than the other leader in that category. So it's, uh, it's been very, very good growth. Um, you don't have to comment, that's just my math. I'll let you do the math. Um, the last thing before the clock expires is, is around capital allocation. You sort okay. of talked about you know, the, the, the targets for 20 going forward versus 2019 and sort of EPS growth. Just talk to us again about how you think about capital allocation, share repurchases, and offsetting some of the stock-based compensation dilution. Well, I mean, capital allocation should more than offset stock-based compensation dilution. We view stock-based compensation <coughs> as, a real, as, as a real expense. Yep. We actually view it as a more valuable currency than cash because it should go up more than cash does in value. Yep. Um, and we don't back it out of any of our EPS numbers. So, uh, and as you've seen, our uh, buybacks are making a significant uh, difference to our share count and therefore way offsetting uh, stock-based compensation dilution. Um, Going forward, we put out a framework. We said we spend uh, you know, 24 billion on buybacks over the four years starting uh, this year. Uh, we're on track to do more than that. Mm -hmm. And we also laid out a framework where between growth in the uh, EBITDA of the business uh, and uh, being a little bit less conservative on our balance sheet, staying around two times gross <coughs> leverage on EBITDA and going to one times net on, uh, on, 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 on net leverage, we can actually turbocharge uh, the buybacks over an extended period of time. So expect us to continue to be aggressively uh, returning capital to shareholders. Great. All right. Well, David, uh, thank Brian, you. Thank you. Rapid, rapid the genius of genius. Yes. When, it, when it hits TV, this is where you heard it first. <laughs> thank you.